I'll bring us back to this question of security and some of its tension with liberty, okay, or some of the ways in which I think this is a fundamental tension that informs the way that surveillance is related to political violence, okay? And I, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and say, that I, I've talked a lot about some ways in which, right, surveillance involves questions of targeting, right, of deciding to apply violence or punishment, right, figuring out who's doing what, and whether or not what they're doing is wrong. It's a, th a threat to order or security, okay, for those who define that, okay? Um, one of the things that this means in terms of the relation to political violence is that the growth of every major surveillance agency, the growth of every major surveillance agency in the United States, okay, so that the sort of organizations that we're going to be talking a lot about on this topic, that list of organizations I gave you earlier, the CIA, the NSA, the FBI, Department of Homeland Security, okay, all of them the growth of those agencies coincided with a period of warfare. Okay. So the times that the U.S. has been most concerned about national security, okay, and that there have been questions of political violence directly on the table, right? How do we organize our society for war? How do we conduct ourselves in that war? Those are the times that the growth of that our sort of surveillance agencies has occurred. Okay, those are the times that's, that's happened. Examples, okay? The FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. <coughs> Excuse me. Founded in 1908, okay? 1908, so around the turn of the last century. That organization initially had like 10 or 15 people in the whole FBI, okay? In part because they were they were assigned to prosecute federal crimes, okay, so not crimes governed by state law, but governed by federal law, and there were very few federal crimes at the time, okay. The major the like major federal crimes that had to be investigated were uh, prostitution or trafficking in women across state lines, okay, this thing called the Mann Act, and uh, antitrust violations, okay, so like cor corporations or other businesses collaborating together to do unfair things with pricing. Those were federal crimes, okay? So in 1908, FBI, not very large, not too many people. When did the FBI rise to prominence? Well, basically as a response to the First World War, okay? In the First World War, the United States instituted a draft, okay? It joined, <coughs> its, uh, it joined a war in Europe Okay, something that a number of political leaders in U.S. history had long said the U.S. had no business doing. They were strongly non-interventionist. So this was a time of pretty significant social and political change. Okay, and it's also a time of immense immigration. Okay, around the turn of the century, millions of people were coming to the United States. Okay, from Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, Western Europe, China. Okay huge immigrant population. And there were a large number of people, okay, who opposed U.S. entrance into the war. Okay. They opposed the draft. They didn't want the U.S. to fight. They were angry with President Wilson, okay. A lot of resistance to World War I, to joining the European war. The FBI, its major responsibility became prosecuting and pursuing Okay, cases in which it organized surveillance of groups who opposed the war, especially immigrants or aliens, okay, people who didn't have uh, citizenship in the United States but were re but resided in the U.S. Okay, the FBI changed its mission in large part, okay, to to organize and try to understand those groups. Okay, and to prosecute and aid in the deportation of a lot of those people. Okay, uh, I I have the text of an editorial. Okay, the the uh, from a magazine, The Nation. Okay, which is a, it's a very a prominent historical left wing magazine in the United States. Okay, and in 1920, in response to a number of FBI raids, okay, against uh, organizations that opposed the war. Okay, many of whom were communists or anarchists. Okay. The FBI organized a series of raids to arrest 
a lot of those people, deport a large number of them. And this editorial was uh, written in response. And I want you to think about how this language, okay, from 1920, okay, how different is it really from a number of the debates that we're having about contemporary surveillance policy, okay? Far the larger number of persons who have been arrested and confined, and over whose heads, if they be aliens, hangs the prospect of deportation to Russia or elsewhere, appear to have been seized merely upon suspicion. Membership in the socialist or communist parties is not a crime, even for an alien. Few of the persons arrested appear to have been given a preliminary hearing in court, or allowed to furnish reasonable bail, or assured of an opportunity to meet their accusers and offer a defense. Right? Those are all civil liberties that are encoded in the Constitution, due process of law that we were talking about earlier. Right? It would even appear that in numerous cases, the persons arrested have been denied the privilege of communicating with their friends or families. Wholesale arrests and deportations, such as we are now witnessing, will not breed respect for government or crush out socialism or communism. The belief that there is in this country one law for the rich and powerful and another for the poor and the weak will be strengthened as will the conviction that free speech, free debate, and free publication or opinion are rights to be enjoyed by such only as say what the Department of Justice and powerful business interests approve. Okay? That is, you have a large number of people on the political, you know, in political opposition okay, who felt that they were being unjustly surveilled and eventually were targets for political violence like deportation or arrest. Okay? That's how, that's how the FBI really cut its teeth. That's how it became the organization that it is today, is in part largely organizing that type of surveillance. Yeah? So basically, people at that point were only allowed freedom of speech to help the government? Well, I, I don't know. This is, I, how about I would say that there is a substantial historical debate about the answer to that question. I think that there is a lot of good evidence that, yes, there was extreme suppression of dissent during World War I. Now, I don't want to, it's like, where you're at debate camp, right, you could find evidence that suggests otherwise, although largely a lot of those FBI activities are now interpreted as historically a mistake, even among people who defend surveillance. Okay, but, so that, that's the FBI. Okay, the NSA, the National Security Agency, okay, before it was called the National Security Agency, it had a, a, a much cooler and more sinister name. Okay, during World War, World War I, it operated as the Black Chamber. <laughs> the black chamber. People, it's like, people, people didn't use nice language like security. It was like, this is the black chamber. No one will ever know that it exists. Okay, and no one did basically. It was it 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 was a secret organization that was housed in a building in New York. Okay, and and what they did is they collected at the. Anybody want to guess at the time? What's the so if we're surveilling the internet today as sort of one of the major sources of communication. During World War I, what would have been one of the most important communication networks to surveil? Newspaper. Newspaper is, is up there, but we're talking about something even newer than newspapers. Telegraphs. Telegraph, okay, telegraph system, right? The basically, not all that long before that, okay, people had finally, they had figured out a way to lay giant telegraph cables under the ocean, okay, so that you could get a telegram from Britain to the United States, say, right, in the course of a few minutes, right? This is revolutionary at the time, right? Before that, you had to wait for a ship to cross the Atlantic Ocean in order to communicate with people across that ocean, right? This is a big deal. Tele tele the telegraph agencies, right, that's, that's the most sophisticated form of communication. Incredibly expensive, really difficult to do, right? Figuring out how to lay those cables, it's like, it's a whole huge thing. We had to figure out how to do it all over again with the internet. It's like a bunch of that stuff set up the precursor to that. But the Black Chamber, okay, the precursor of the NSA, okay, basically cooperated with all of the telegraph companies in the United States. They went to them, not with any legal authority, but just asking, okay, because they were all basically part of uh, sort of the elite upper echelons of the society. And they said, hey, telegraph companies, we want every telegraph that's sent between all of the embassies and consulates, okay, so the representatives of different foreign governments, right, like Russia, Germany, Britain, they all have embassies or consulates in, in the United States and Washington, D.C. We want all of the telegrams that go to those consulates and embassies. And the, the telegraph companies, 
Okay, something that once again should be maybe setting off some some familiarity about the historical debate versus contemporary debate. All of those companies agreed and said, sure, we will we will give you the we will give you that information. Okay, the U.S. collected a huge amount of intelligence information about uh, all of the other governments, including its allies. Okay, during World War One, that's the precursor to the NSA. Okay, that's what that's what's known as signals intelligence. Okay, when you get information okay about the signals that that your the targets of surveillance are sending that signals intelligence the nsa did a lot of that okay? that's the precursor organization the cia okay the central intelligence agency okay was created in the aftermath of world war ii aftermath of world war ii during world war ii the office of, the organization of special services the oss okay, was the intelligence agency that operated in the united states there was no cia yet okay after the war, okay, a number of people said, well, this intelligence, this set of intelligence operations, covert operations, code breaking, all of that stuff gave us a huge advantage in World War II. We should keep doing that. Okay? That gave that that's the birth of the CIA. The CIA is a response to the continuation of wartime intelligence gathering versus our enemies, okay, to move into intelligence gathering about both enemies and allies. So, to sort of, like, I'm, sorry, I'm trying to, I gotta cut out some places so that I can actually get to any of these other sections. To wrap up a little bit some of this thinking about security and the way that surveillance is connected to wartime, okay, I just want to highlight some ways in which, okay, the gathering of information, the surveillance historically, okay, when you generate a bunch of information, oftentimes there are people who want to put that information to use for which it was not originally designed. Okay, so for example, those FBI raids on radical and, and anti-war groups wasn't necessarily the original purpose of the FBI, but it became the purpose of the FBI. To give you a sense of some of the different norms that have operated at different times, that Black Chamber organization that was collecting all the telegraph information, when there was a new Secretary of State in 1929, okay, Henry Stimson found out about this. He, he, he come, becomes Secretary of State, they hand him a bunch of telegrams that's like, oh, this is from the, the German and British embassies, and he, he shuts the whole thing down. And he says, quote, gentlemen, do not read one another's mail. <laughs> Gentlemen, do not read one another's mail. I'm just like, no, we don't do this. Okay? Uh, Henry Stimson, Secretary of State in 1929. Okay? One Stimson okay, served as a cabinet member in World War II and then became part of a political administration okay, that gave birth to the CIA and the NSA. So... <laughs> Gentlemen may not have read one another's mail in between World War I and World War II, but you can be sure that after World War II, they definitely did. <laughs> okay, but a number of those sort of qualms about both foreign and domestic surveillance went out the window. Okay, one of the difficulties, and this is a difficulty that we'll have in debating this topic a lot, okay, is that the security successes, okay, that come from surveillance, the argument that people make most often is that those successes are unknown, okay, in two ways. One, okay, if I surveil someone, I anticipate what they're gonna do, and I arrest them, okay, or I prosecute them, I don't know whether or not I, they would have been successful, right? I can't tell. I don't know the results of what would have happened if we hadn't acted on the information that we gathered, okay? And two, if I'm surveilling you, and like I said, it's based on an imbalance of information, so I don't tell you what I know, okay? That means that people who are doing surveillance at these government agencies keep secret how they do it and what they're doing. It's classified information for the most part, okay? So in assessing whether or not we're actually getting much out of the security side of this equation, it can be very difficult to know. Okay? It's very difficult to assess, whereas some of the abuses of civil liberties, of liberty, okay, that come with surveillance, those examples are more well known because they are public information, okay? People get angry about 
the breaches in civil liberties, though oftentimes not angry enough to actually stop those from happening. Okay? A couple other wartime, wartime examples of domestic surveillance, okay, in which the pursuit of security, this is a, a theme of this topic, that the pursuit of security through surveillance often ends up producing violations of liberty for people who are the most vulnerable in our society. Okay? So, for example, during World War II, the United States interned okay, the population, all Japanese Americans living west of the Mississippi, put them in what most, most of the historians of that time have now started referring to as concentration camps. Okay? It's like they, they, were, they were political prisoners. They were politically surveilled. Okay? Their civil liberties were violated. There is a whole, I was going to read another long card, but I don't have time, on, don't have time for this. Uh, there's a whole host of programs that the FBI used in the post-World War II era, justified by the fear of communism, okay, to conduct surveillance on members of various political movements in the United States that the director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, disagreed with. Okay? Martin Luther King, he was the subject of surveillance by the FBI. The FBI actually generated a mock letter encouraging King to reflect on and uh, you know, ultimately decide to commit suicide. The FBI was like, oh, if we, if we start generating enough information about King and some of these civil, you know, the civil rights activists, we can undermine their faith, undermine their integrity, their threat to our country's security, okay? Because they're advertising to all of our enemies that our society is racially unjust, okay? So Hoover targeted all sorts of people in various civil rights organizations, anti-war organizations during Vietnam, okay? The major program, the sort of label that you'll likely see discussed in a variety of the, uh, of the sort of topic research on this is that the acronym is COINTEL PRO. COINTEL PRO. So CO, I N, T, INTEL PRO. Stands for Counterintelligence Program. That is, the FBI treated a number of the members of our society as intelligence agents. Counterintelligence is something that you do against people who are spying on your society, spying on your country. Okay? Counterintelligence. The FBI decided to dedicate a lot of those surveillance resources to groups that oftentimes now, when we write the history of our country, those are groups and people that we strongly admire for changing the racially unjust balance of, of our society. Right? So that's when we talk about some of that tension between liberty and security, I think it's a very serious thing to, to keep in mind, to sort of keep track of. Okay? Examples from the current war on terror era. Okay, all of you are sort of children of this era, right? We've been fighting a, quote, war on terror for most of, if not all of your lives, okay? The NSA, the National Security Agency component of surveillance, like I said, is gonna largely be talked about in the affirmative lecture, okay? But they've done mass surveillance of the internet, emails, phone calls, basically all information that's transmitted across fiber optic cables in the United States. The NSA has developed technologies that in the same way that they used to do wiretapping of the telegraph and the telegram companies, okay, and phone lines, those taps have now been applied to the internet. There are technologies that just duplicate all, it's like the internet basically travels through giant fiber optic cables that ultimately have to go between different countries in big hubs, okay. It's like there's a building somewhere in San Francisco where a gigantic fiber optic cable comes in and that's all the internet traffic that, for instance, AT&T, okay, sends across the Pacific Ocean, goes through that building, goes through that cable. The NSA, according to information that we received largely from Edward Snowden, okay, has a program where they developed a technological device that they put onto that cable and because it's just transmitting light, fiber optic cables just transmit light, okay, it copies the entire signature of that cable and then stores all that information at the NSA. All, the, whole, the whole thing, the, all, the whole internet, <laughs> since I understand how the internet works. Uh, okay. But okay. something to keep in mind in terms of the way in which wartime pressures about security tend to permit or escalate the level of surveillance. Okay. I gotta move on to my next section, otherwise I'm not gonna get any of this stuff. Okay? 
Technological shifts. Section two, we have a half an hour left. We're on section two. It's better coverage than I usually get. Okay. <laughs> I want you to I want I want you to think about a question for a moment up prompt and then you know, you've got to think carefully about this question to answer correctly. We talked a little bit about those freedoms earlier, civil liberties and freedoms. One of them that I mentioned very briefly is freedom of the press. Okay, freedom of the press. Why do we have something that's called freedom of the press? So people can write what they want. And as long as it's not taking away the rights or liberties of someone, they can't be arrested for it. Okay, so we want to generate a bunch of journalism. I, I agree with you. That gets at some of the role of journalism in our society. Well, um, perhaps it's so that ideas can spread more easily. Yep, strongly connected, right? A lot of journalism producing a bunch of different opinions. We spread ideas, okay, to generate dissent, to generate discussion and debate. Yeah. Affirmation against the use of censorship largely because in the American Revolution the printing press played a huge role in disseminating information and the spread of news. Okay, yeah, I, li I like that answer. We're, we're, you're getting real close to the sort of specific thing that I'm looking at. Everybody's doing a great job talking about these concepts. I want you to think a little bit about why I put this in the category of technological shifts. Like earlier we had the printing press, now we have a printer and the like fax and machines and all this stuff, so we're able to, we should be uh, able to use technologies and uh, like media and really everything. We can't like only print certain things. No, we're like allowed to print everything. Yeah. Questions of surveillance and information, this is sort of what you were getting at with the end of your answer as well, they involve questions of technology. Okay? We don't think about it this way, but the printing press was a revolutionary informational technology. Okay? So think about that for a moment. Think about that for a moment. Right? We're really only going back about 400 years or so, okay, to have the introduction of printing presses, you know, duplicate printing. Before that, what did people have to do if they wanted to wanted to have a book? You gotta hand write it out, right? It's like, I don't know if any of you have ever tried to hand copy a whole book, say Charles Dickens' Great Expectations or something like that, right? It's gonna take a long time, okay? Printing information, or not even printing, writing information, super expensive, very highly, it's like a, a highly technical capacity. People used to have a, a position, they'd be a scribe, right? It's like my whole job is just copying things, and in fact, I'm one of the only people in my society who might even know how to do that, <laughs> right? What those words mean, how, how you write, the tools that you use. So the printing press was a revolutionary technology for spreading information. Suddenly, you could mass produce thousands of copies of certain information. And I can give that to whoever I want, right? Newspaper, magazine, whatever. It's the, it's, the, it's the printing press. It's the freedom of the press, okay? Not, we tend to think of it in terms of the abstract, like, oh, it's about journalism, right? The press means journalism. That's true, but it has a deeper meaning as well about information technologies. That is, they're always connected, right? How we produce information changes the type of society that we have, okay? Before the printing press, before the mass use of print, People generally were not literate. They could not read or write, okay? Imagine if you went through your whole life never having read anything. How, how sophisticated do you think the information that you would have about your society would be? How easy would it be for you to keep track of anything? It's like the political opinions or goings on in the capital of your country, no, right? No idea, no clue. No ability to keep track of most of that information, okay? So when, revolutionary governments built in something like freedom of the press, what they were doing was designing freedoms that were intended to protect the most sophisticated informational technologies of their day. Right? The, the printing press, that was, that was as complicated as it got. But it was very important, right? A couple people pointed that out. I suspect applying lessons from their, you know, U.S. history or, or you know, history classes, in middle school, high school, you know, wherever you are, okay, you've learned something about the Revolutionary War at this point. It's like, yeah, without, without newspapers, without the ability to say, 
this is what we're doing, right? It's like, in order for people to care about the Declaration of Independence, you gotta print it on something. <laughs> you gotta show everybody copies, right? If it's just one person passing it on by word of mouth, how well is that gonna work? Okay? <laughs> Right, yes, exactly. Then that's the other thing, precision too, right? It's like if I'm saying these are core principles of our country and we need to follow them exactly, if that's just passed by word of mouth, chances are that's not going to work super well, right? We're going to disagree about what that information even is, okay? So changes in informational technology are tied to huge changes in society and politics. Okay, with the introduction of the printing press in a mass literate society, right, where basically we educate most everybody, or we attempt to, to educate everybody in our society to read okay, and, and write. And we do an okay job at it, a much, 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 much better job than, say, you know, uh, a society in Europe in 1350, right? So we have a public, okay, who is accustomed to debating issues by reading about them by understanding them in the kind of depth and detail that you get from mass press, okay? Now, in terms of our controversy for domestic surveillance, I want you to think about the fact that our Bill of Rights does not in any way reference anything like the internet, okay? It just, how could it, right? There's no, there is no right in our system that is specifically designed to deal with the internet. There isn't even one that's designed to deal with the telephone, okay? Instead, our legislature, okay, Congress, and our courts over time have interpreted and tried to apply a number of laws, okay, or principles like freedom of the press, okay, or freedom of expression to new information technologies, to new information technologies like the internet, okay, like phones, okay? And the limits on surveillance are tied then to a bunch of the interpretations of these very, very old precedents, these very, very old concepts that were designed for a set of technologies that we now don't, we don't think of them as technologies, right? You do not think of your pen and paper as some sophisticated technological system. It is, it's just not a technological innovation from your era, okay? What this means for our controversy is that there is a lot of law, okay, technological innovation and legal innovation, the application of legal concepts, those move at different speeds. Most of the people who are making decisions about how to apply the precedents, our legal precedents, about freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, okay, a number of these important liberties, chances are, okay, that they are at least 50 years old, a lot of them are a lot older, okay? They did not grow up using the internet. Some of them may still like, it's like, you know, chances are, how, how many of you uh, have grandparents who don't, that's like, that whole internet thing, like email is uh, a little shaky. Okay, raise your hand, it's like, oh, I fixed my, my parents' or my grandparents' computer because they just do not understand what's going on. Raise your hand, okay. Yeah, right? This is a common experience because honestly, most of you, Okay, are better adapted to a variety of the te informational technologies that we have around us than I am, and certainly than a bunch of people on the Supreme Court in terms of their every like everyday day-to-day -day usage. Right? It's like so. Now think about the way in which our controversy are going to be dealing with a society that's really trying to catch up to apply a bunch of its fundamental concepts about information and surveillance to a whole new set of technologies. Okay the internet being the most prominent example. You are going to have a large number of debates about how and whether certain legal concepts should apply to protect people who are using new informational technologies. There have been a number of very important court cases in recent years and months about the application of these precedents, and you're going to be debating about them for sure. Another couple of little just historical examples here about technological shifts that I want to use to draw out this theme. Okay, we've already talked a little bit about the FBI. Anybody know who's the most famous person associated with the FBI in our society? Anybody know? Huh? I said the director. Okay, direct, who's the most famous director of the FBI? J. Edgar Hoover, okay? He ran the FBI for several 
decades. I want you to think about that. It's like through, you know, I, I can't remember the exact number of presidencies. I think it's like, it's got to be at least seven or eight presidential administrations. The same person ran the FBI. The same person ran the organization that controlled and stored the most incriminating and most secret data that our society generated for decades. Okay? Here's something that I did not know about J. Edgar Hoover until recently. Do you know one of the reasons that he was hired to run the, what was it at the time referred to as the Radicals Division of the FBI, right? They were prosecuting all those anti-war groups, people who opposed the war, etc. J. Edgar Hoover, okay, one of the reasons he was hired for that position was that he was an expert with what supreme informational, you know, technological way of organizing information, the card catalog. The card catalog. He had worked at the Library of Congress for a number of years before he moved to the FBI, okay? And he, I, I kid you not, okay, he came to the FBI, he's like, all this information is so disorganized, everybody collects these reports, but there's no way of organizing them. We are going to have a radical institutional transformation. We're going to put all of this information in a card catalog. Everybody will use index cards to keep track of their information. Okay? J. Edgar Hoover, informational library scientist. Okay? You didn't know. Chances are, it's, like, you didn't, right? it's a way to think about how okay, the controversies that come up with regards to new technologies, it's not as though that didn't happen before when those new technologies were different. Okay? When we talk about this controversy, there are going to be a lot of historical examples and analogies that get used in part because these, and the reason I've chosen these as themes is these issues come up over and over and over again, right? Whether and how to organize information, part of the reason that you know the card catalog was like the cutting edge informational technology of its day is that people finally were learning how to store, that we were producing enough books to actually store them in a gigantic library that one person couldn't keep track of. J. Edgar Hoover was working at the Library of Congress because the Library of Congress was designing its first informational system for keeping track of all of the books that it had, right? It's like, that was cutting, it was a cutting edge technological solution to the problem of information, okay? Last couple examples. One of the important cases of surveillance right now, the sort of mass surveillance of the internet, okay? One of the legal authorities that has been used to say, okay, the NSA gets to keep track of all of this data on the internet, is a court ruling, okay, that applied, and this is what I mean when I say it's like different historical precedents or controversies inform our current one, okay? They applied a set of legal judgments that had been made about a, a, an old, what is now an old technological device. It's called a pen register, pen register device. Okay? It's the technology that was first designed to keep track of the incoming and outgoing phone numbers that one phone used. Okay? So the FBI they had a bunch of pen register devices and, and there was a legal question. How, you know, can, is, it, is it legal to tap this person's phone to know what numbers are going in and out of this one phone? Pen register authority is what it was called. Okay, pen register authority. The court said, yeah, you have the authority to do this in some cases. Most cases you need a warrant, some cases you don't. Okay. Now, that precedent has been applied. The NSA, the National Security Agency, went to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court the FISA court, something that once again is going to be talked about in much more detail in the affirmative lecture, went to the FISA court. This is the court that just it controls all of the rulings about intelligence surveillance in our country, basically, okay, and said to the NSA, well, look, we have this authority to use these pen register devices. That's the same thing as this device that replicates the whole internet. The court said, you are correct. That is the same as a device that replicates the whole internet. Sure. So, sure. in thinking for a moment what I say when I say technological shifts and how our society may have difficulty keeping up with a number of the ways in which these different techniques are related to 
how and whether or not we can surveil people, okay, that's a, th there's stuff like this all over the place. Right. Okay, we're getting, we're getting close to the end here. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and shift to section three, okay, value shifts, value shifts. We've already been talking a lot about values in the sense that liberty and security are sort of two competing value structures for organizing surveillance, okay? But I want you now to think a little bit about one of the other sort of important values that we'll be discussing or sort of important concepts that comes into play with surveillance, and that is the concept of privacy, okay? Privacy. I'm just going to use this as an example about some of the ways in which we're also having a debate over the larger direction of our society for how it thinks about something like privacy, okay? <laughs> what can anybody think of, I'm thinking now of, a, of, it's like this is a science fiction book, a like representation of a totalitarian, totally surveillance society. What is the book or the sort of idea that I'm thinking of? 1984. 1984. How many of you have read and or heard of 1984? Raise your hand. Okay. This, this book was an, perhaps the most successful example of trying to use fiction as, and science fiction, as a tool of kind of cultural and political education, right? It's like it's been read in our society in high schools and middle schools for decades. It is famous and there is, it is organized fundamentally around sort of the concept or value of privacy, the separation between an individual and their government, okay? And I have here, I wanna just take a couple minutes to watch a minute that back, I, can, I remember talking with my parents about, it's like I was born in 1981, okay? And I remember talking with my parents, not in 1984, but later when I was in high school reading 1984, they said, oh yeah, when we got to the year 1984, I remember thinking, we're in the future. It is 1984. The title of the book is now, wrong. You know, it's like, this is inception level thinking, right? We're in 1984, okay? And this was just, it was a, you know, a kind of very, a shattering moment for them, right? They had read this back in the 60s, and then suddenly it's 20, 20 plus years in the future. We're in the future. How close is our society to 1984 was like a very present topic at the time. Okay. Our, how close are we to an authoritarian or totalitarian state? And I want to play for you for a moment the trailer, okay, the trailer for the movie 1984 produced in 1984, okay? No, oops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Oh, internet. Uh, what is happening? The volume is on. Hello? Uh, well, this is disappointing. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, anyone have any guesses? What's wrong? If the sound's the not sound. working. Here, uh, did you turn the sound on on the panel? Yeah. It, did you change anything from when you played the Snowden video? No. Then I, I don't know. Sorry, let me, I want to see if that's Snowden. Uh, there you go. No, it's Right. Reloading the Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Give me one second. So you have I, ten years' experience. Oh, it's because we have to watch an ad. I don't have a I'm sorry. <laughs> I tried to skip this. You don't mind if I just record this? There we go. Okay. No, it's still not working. Is it? What? <laughs> no, it's not. I, I think it's not going to work. Turner. Okay. So. <laughs> Anyway, my huge dramatic moment for 1984 has been subverted by technology. Who would, who would have guessed? Okay? But I want you to, just for a moment, okay, I want you to think about some of the major features of this book and movie and its idea about mass surveillance. Okay? There are a few things. One, okay, this book is fundamentally concerned with information deletion. 
Okay, we're gonna our society is in trouble because what if we just delete most of history from the history books? Okay, people can just make it into ideology. Okay, second, it's about technologies of privacy. Okay, what is the major device for surveillance in 1984? Who can tell me? The TV and the telescreen, right? It's a television that works both ways. You see it and it sees you. Okay? This is fundamentally scary to you know George Orwell and people writing about this. What is the technology that Winston Smith, the hero of the book, uses to try and create a like private life for himself? His journal. His diary, right? He writes stuff in it. It's his journal. It's a book as opposed to this visual, you know, televisual big brother, you know, environment in which everything is seen, okay, and everything is observed, okay, so it's fundamentally a book about the way in which different technologies inform the values that we have about privacy versus authoritarianism, okay, so I promised you something about a value shift, right, if this is, I would say for you, your parents, and your grandparents, 1984 is one of the fundamental organizing concepts for how people interpret the danger of surveillance and authoritarianism, right? If you were to say Big Brother, right, that's one of, you'll, you will read so many pieces of evidence this year that reference the concept of Big Brother that you will get really tired of it, okay? <laughs> but is Big Brother operating in our society in quite the same way that Orwell anticipated in terms of the application of privacy? I give you Big Brother. Tonight on CBS, season 15. Oh, <laughs> he promises to bring plenty of twists and turns that you won't see coming. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Corsetti for ENTV and TVLine.com's all the details. The cast of Big Brother 15 kicked off last night with 16 new house guests. And like every year, it's full of interesting characters. I love the ladies, and the ladies love me. <laughs> I put myself in front of the mirror and just like hold my back and see how hard it is and like touch my ass here and there. Then there's Nick, who is an entrepreneur who screams Peter Parker, you can't wait to turn into Spider-Man. I'm not like Spider-Man, I can lay down the smack when I need to. I'm going to be the hardest working player ever. Other noteworthy characters include the Texas girl, Erin. I might come off like a girly girl, but I have no problem getting my hands dirty. The Minnesota bartender, Taylor, and Alyssa. Okay. <laughs> We're done with the true horror that is Big Brother season 15. Okay. Why, do, why am I showing you a clip of a reality TV show? Okay. In part because, okay, I want to suggest that especially for, you know, it's like people my age and above, okay, and probably mostly people who are older and more curmudgeonly than me, okay, one of the things that we do not understand, or at the very least we see as controversial, right, that's part of our debate about where our society is going, is that most of you, like how many of you post pictures to uh, Instagram or Facebook or other social media? Ever, okay? How many of you post updates about yourself and where you are and where you're going to your friends on social media? Raise your hand. <laughs> Twitter, any form, how many of you use social media here? Okay. In, from my perspective in many ways, okay, I don't, I don't have I don't have Facebook. Once again, I will cross apply what I said before, I'm technophobe, okay? You all are largely responsible for surveilling yourselves. <laughs> we don't need the telescreen to follow you around in whatever room you're in because you carry one, okay? And you use it voluntarily all the time, okay? Chances are you have more pictures, information, video stored about yourselves and your personal history than most people have ever, even the richest and most powerful members of, that, of our society could have had back when we designed most of our concepts like privacy and connection to liberty, right? It's like somebody who was super, super duper rich in the 1870s or in the 1790s or you know, in any of the other historical periods in our society, they might have a painting of themselves and perhaps a treasured family photograph Right? That would, it's like it would go where it would be passed down from generation to generation because getting a photograph was super complicated. Okay? These people 
thought about privacy and the difference between their private lives and their public lives fundamentally differently than most of you. You use information technologies in a way that informs what you think of as information that is appropriately private versus appropriately public very differently from a number of people who have come before you. That is at the core of some of our debates about surveillance. It, though we will be debating the question of government surveillance, right? the reason that I brought up the aspect of value shift is that there is a whole set of people who wonder whether or not anybody your age actually cares about surveillance or feels threatened by it at all, given that most of you transmit and use a lot of information about yourselves and people around you to a degree that prior societies just have not had access to. They haven't had to face that set of questions. Okay, And so, well, I don't want to, you can read any number of articles on the internet about how privacy is dead, okay, or <laughs> that privacy has fundamentally changed. The way in which this might influence the debate topic is to start to think about how to apply value choices to the gathering and use of information. How much should our society care about privacy? How much should it protect the rights of people to use information in a way that they expect to be private rather than public? Okay? Those questions are all at the core of this topic. And it's also something that it, our understanding of what tyranny looks like, what authoritarianism looks like, what the sort of you know ultimate goal of complete surveillance might look like has changed a lot too. Okay? 1984 is a totally bleak society in which Winston Smith says, you know, to imagine the future, imagine a boot stomping on a human face into eternity, or you know, forever. I can't remember the exact line. Okay, it's super bleak. Everything is really grim. Okay. There are a whole set of people who argue that the dangers that we now face from surveillance have less to do with the production of a society that's super grim and more to do with a society where we're all the dude who works out his abs and just shows himself off to everybody else all of the time and is super happy about it. Okay? <laughs> that if our attitudes about ourselves are capable of changing okay, with technology so rapidly, that that raises fundamental questions about the values that we use to make those decisions. Okay. Now, wanted, I'll, I will try and keep myself to an actual five, maybe ten minutes. I may ask a tiny bit more of your time to just give a hint at my last section, which is organizational politics and design. Okay. The reason I bring up this this section is that one of the core questions for our topic is also. Who has the authority to do what? Who has the authority to do what with regards to surveillance? Who gets to do it? Okay, what legal limitations are placed on them, if any? And what are the relationships between those organizations? Okay, does anybody know the FBI, the NSA, the Department of Homeland Security? What branch of government are all of those agencies part of? The executive. The executive. Executive. Several of you said the executive, right? They are not part of the legislative branch. That is, they're not run by Congress, and they're not part of the courts. Okay? The balance between those different parts of our government are very important for surveillance. Okay? The executive has historically, okay, they have asserted a large number of surveillance powers. Okay? As an example, okay? as examples of two historical controversies that are at play. How many of you have heard of Watergate? Raise your hands if you're heard of Watergate. Okay, good. I'm glad to know that it hasn't yet disappeared into something that people don't know about. That's good. Okay, Watergate. President Nixon. How many of you know that Watergate is related to questions of surveillance? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Okay. President Nixon very upset about a number of political opponents and leakers in the administration, created a squad known as the Plumbers, okay, to go pursue and seek out those who are leaking information. Okay, One of the primary targets, a guy named Daniel Ellsberg. Daniel Ellsberg. Anybody, anybody know, know what he did? What did Daniel Ellsberg do? Oh, see, now we're getting into more details. Did he pay the Plumbers to like go spy? He was a he's a target of surveillance. Daniel Ellsberg, target of surveillance. Why? 
He leads the Pentagon Papers. Okay? He, he was, in many ways, the Edward Snowden of his day. Many people have made comparisons, including Ellsberg himself. He got a bunch of classified documents together that proved that the Kennedy administration, the Johnson administration, and the Nixon administration, and military and intelligence and officials in all, of the, in all three of those administrations had lied about the conduct of the Vietnam War. They had lied about how the US got involved. They had lied about the extent of US involvement. Okay, that there was, this was a set of classified information to say this, the whole premise of the Vietnam War, we've been told a series of lies by government officials. And Nixon hated this guy. Okay? He had the plumbers raid his therapist's office to get his therapy records. They tapped his phone. They surveilled him in all sorts of ways. Okay? They also broke into Watergate. Okay? The building in Washington, D.C. that housed the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee, Nixon's primary political opponents in the election. Okay? The plumbers, and Nixon, by the way, Nixon and various Nixon administration officials said all of this was legal because the president, as the enforcer of the law, okay, can't break the law. Can't break the law. This is executive privilege. This is executive authority. Okay? Not only do you have no right to know about it, there's no legal authority that trumps it. Okay? Now, why do I bring this up? Well, in part because it's one of the most famous organizational controversies with regards to surveillance. There was a whole uh, set of investigations that happened as a result of this. When they broke the Watergate scandal, the church committee, right down the church committee, okay, Congress, investigated the activities of the FBI, the NSA, and the CIA in terms of their domestic surveillance and placed a number of important limitations on what they were allowed to do. The church committee suggested reforms were responsible for producing the FISA court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Okay? They created a special court to oversee these agencies to place limitations on them. Remember how I said that historically controversies about surveillance return and we kind of run up against the same set of issues again and again? Well, okay. at the time of the church committee, the church committee tried to call the director of the CIA to testify in front of Congress. Okay. Director of the CIA, you've got to come testify in front of Congress. Several people working in the Ford administration said no. The CIA director, in fact, has no obligation to testify in front of Congress. He will instead brief you, not in public. So he'll give you a set of things that he's thinking about. You don't get to ask him questions. He will brief you, and no one in the public will get to hear what he says. Okay? If you know one of, the pro one of the prominent Ford advisors who recommended this legal strategy, who said the CIA director has no obligation to testify in front of the church committee? Hoover. The guy behind Watergate? Dick Cheney. <laughs> Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, a number of people who were Nixon administration officials and then later Ford administration officials, okay? They have been fighting a battle over the nature of executive authority and presidential authority to enact surveillance going back to the late 60s and early 70s. Okay? This set of controversies about what the NSA, the FBI, the CIA can do right now, okay, it's not only some of the same themes that return okay, in terms of who has the authority, it's some of the same people. <laughs> We're dealing with a set of legal authorities, legal questions, and political questions that our society has been debating for decades. Okay, but I would say, and I hope one of the things that you know, sort of the camp experience brings out to you, and hopefully the topic lecture as well, okay, is that really understanding a lot of those controversies means not just being informed about what's going on right now, okay, but also understanding a number of the historical themes and debates that we've had about this very same topic, about a different set of technologies, a different set of people, but some of the same fundamental political questions about the limitations or extent of surveillance in our society. OK, there we go. I almost, I almost covered. Thank you very much for all of